want to talk to you about something that is very near and dear to my heart. It's something that's, sometimes I come up and, you know, we have a particular passage for that day and we're walking through a book of the Bible or something like that. Today we're going to start a four-part series called Deadly Beliefs. And it's, it's so near and dear to my heart because I've seen how detrimental it can be in believers' lives. I've seen people go without joy. I've seen people go without peace. I've seen people that, that have walked away from church altogether because of deadly beliefs. And these beliefs can unintentionally hurt other people. They don't just hurt the person who believes them. They unintentionally, or maybe even sometimes intentionally, hurt other people thinking that they're doing the right thing. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Up here on the screen, we're going to put a, a, up a, a picture. At the onset of World War I, there were several different factories. And these different factories were established across the United States. And one of the things that they were doing is they, wanted, they were producing watches. They were producing watches for the military. They were producing watches for um, folks just in, in everyday life in the business world, things like that. But but they were producing these watches, and as you can imagine, they really didn't have something that if you were trying to look at your watch at night, they didn't have, you know, the, necessarily like a battery in it, you know, that would really, you know, cause it to illuminate like we would today. And so what they did, if you can see up here on the, on the screen, is they had these little dials, you know, and like the, the little numbers and everything on there, they painted them with radium. They mixed radium, the substance, with paint. And as you know today, radium is a radioactive element that glows in the dark. And so if you just saw that previous picture, they would have these young ladies. And they hired a lot of young ladies because these young ladies had small hands and they were able to grip these fine, you know, paint brushes. And, and these Factories actually paid really good money. I mean, you wanted to work in, in these places. And so what they would do is they would paint just very lightly and delicately. Their, their hands were suited for this very detailed work. And watches actually use radium. Some of y'all have been alive even during the time that they did. They used radium up until the 1960s. And they used it on different materials but to make it glow because it will actually glow. And now in this day and age, if you have something that will glow, you know what to do. You know, you kind of hold it up to the light and, you know, and it kind of charges it or whatever. And then, and then you can turn the light off and it'll illuminate. But radium will actually stay illuminated. Are you ready for this? For up to 1600 years. This stuff didn't exactly go out. Okay. So you can see everyone thought that this was the greatest material. And there was a catch. It's radium because it's radioactive. And so what's more is the painters, these young ladies, they ingested the radioactive substance as part of their job. You can imagine if you're painting, if some of y'all do painting, maybe you do like some watercolor, things like that, or maybe you do some special painting. Have you ever done this where you take that paintbrush and you just kind of stick it on your tongue just like this? You know, and you kind of sharpen the point of the, of the brush and so a lot of what these ladies were doing is, again, they had this detailed, fine work, and so they would, they would put it on their tongue, and they would get it real nice and fine before they went in, and they started painting. And, and so what began to happen is, you know, that they were ingesting it, and they didn't even know that they were doing it. And so these women were hired to paint these dials, and they, they became known as ghost girls. Fascinating, because the radium dust, it wasn't just in the paint, it was actually in the in the factories themselves, and it was exposed daily to their clothes, to their hair, to their skin, and it, and it quite literally made them glow. It's kind of interesting that we say when a person is radiant, they're glowing, you know? It has, think about the radium that made them glow. So many of these women actually wore their best dresses on the job so that the fabric would shine brightly when they went dancing after work. And some applied the paint to their teeth because it gave them, quote-unquote, radium smiles, radiant smiles. 
In the early 1920s, some of the radium girls started to develop symptoms, though. Fatigue, definitely toothaches, you can imagine. And the first death uh, occurred in 1922 when a 22-year-old, her name is Molly Magia, died after reportedly enduring years of pain. And they, didn't, they couldn't understand this. They couldn't understand what, what was going on. In fact, uh, Molly Magia, they actually um, said that she had syphilis, but she was actually suffering from a condition called radium jaw. Hang with me, but her entire lower jawbone had become so brittle that her doctor removed, removed her jawbone just by simply lifting it out. And during this time, people thought radium was good. They thought it was good. I mean, not just on painting, but they thought it was good even for your body. There were, it was added to a number of everyday products from toothpaste to cosmetics to even food and drinks. One such prep, uh, preparation, it was called Radithor. We'll put a picture of here on the screen. You can actually see. You can go back and look all this stuff up. Radithor, it was simply distilled water with tiny amounts of radium dissolved in it. And it was boldly advertised as a cure for the living dead. Perpetual sunshine is how it was advertised. And it promised to tackle various ailments from arthritis to gout. It's something that they thought was good and it was something that brought about a slow and painful death. And we look back and we go, man, that's crazy. Those poor women exposing themselves over and over to a deadly substance. But what if I told you that there is a belief that works its way into many Christians' lives and it works a lot like radium because it glows. It gives the appearance of light, but it's not light. It gives the appearance of morality, but it's not. It gives the appearance of godliness, but it's absolutely deadly. It is a belief that zaps your joy, that creates a, a spiritual fatigue in you, and it has been around for thousands of years. And so I want to talk to you about today the deadly belief of legalism. The deadly belief of legalism. So if you've got your Bible today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And I'm going to be in verse 1. And we're going to just simply read through verse 9. It says, Then Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? Now notice that word, traditions. Not rules of God, not the law, not the precepts, nothing like that, traditions, okay? Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders and they don't wash their hands when they eat? Now, let me explain this to you real quick. When a lot of the Pharisees ate, what they would do is they wanted to be ceremonially clean, okay? And so they wanted, it, it was a good thing to be ceremonially clean. We have all this, you know, in Old Testament, but one of the rules that they added, tradition, is that they would take their hands and they would put them in a basin of water and then they would lift their hands up. This had nothing to do with germs, by the way. They didn't even know that germs existed back in this day and age. So they would put them down in the water and they would lift their hands up and the water would drip down. It would go down their elbows and come off. And so what they were saying essentially is they, they wanted to be uh, spiritually clean. They wanted to be uh, have cleanliness as opposed to uncleanness, spiritually speaking. And then they would go and they would eat. It was very ritualistic, okay? And they are come to Jesus and they said, why don't your disciples do this? Why don't you do this? What, what's going on? See, they had put a rule. They had put morality on top of God's law that it was never in God's law. Well, let's see what happens. In verse 3, he answered them. And, and notice what Jesus' language is. He says, why do you break God's commandment? Do you see the difference? Commandment versus tradition. Why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. Now, this goes back to the, the fifth Old Testament law of the Ten Commandments, okay? 
And so he's saying, you, you're told to honor your father or mother. You know, when you honor your father or mother, have you ever noticed that it says that it may go well with you and you may live a long life? Have you ever wondered why this is the one commandment that talks about living a, a long life? Because if you didn't honor your father or mother, the command was to put you to death, okay? That's why that you live an, a long life in the land of the living. And then it goes on to say, but whatever you say in verse 5, Whoever tells his father and mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you nullify the word of God because of your tradition. Now, here's what was happening. God gave them the commandment to take care of their parents. Put yourself in this day and age. In this day and age, you, you had a, a situation where there, there was no social security. If, if your parents grew old, then you needed to be there in order to help them in their old age. You needed to help them get around. You needed to help, in some cases, even feed them to go to the bathroom. I mean, th there, was, there was nothing that was there. And so you were called to honor your father and mother. And so sometimes that costs you financially. And so what happened here is they would come on the scene and, and the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were, were teaching, you know what, say this, Instead of giving that money to take care of mom and dad in their old age, they would do something, listen to me, that sounds spiritual, sounds moral, sounds godly. Let's take that money and let's give it to the temple. So whatever help that you would have received that you would have given to your parents, you know what, I'm gonna be real spiritual and I'm gonna give it to the temple. I'm gonna give it to God. And what does Jesus say in verse 7? Hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, teachings as doctrine, doctrines, human commands. And so he says, listen, this legalistic system is all about lip service, but it has nothing to do with the heart. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is we, I really just want to take you on a, on a journey of understanding this. And so maybe if you've got your notes, you can jot a few things down. I've got some little diagrams, I guess you could say, to kind of help us follow along. But, but I want to put this up here on the screen because I, let's just talk about normal discipleship. Normal discipleship looks like this. When you're living your life for Jesus with a pure heart, this is the type of, this is the type of discipleship that Jesus wants from you. God is at the head of your life. God is at the head of your life. It starts with a proper view of God and God's rules for your life. So we'll put that up there. So there's God and we have God in a proper place and we understand that God gives us rules, precepts, and commands to his people. So God gives rules to his people, okay? Don't steal, don't covet, don't lie. He gives you other commandments that aren't like, not don'ts, okay? Like love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so here's, here's the deal. But why? Why does God give us rules? Why does God give us precepts? And it all goes back, I want you to see this. We have to understand the motives of God. Because I hear a lot of times that people will walk away from their faith and walk away from Christianity because they see the rules of God as a way that God tries to smother them. Or at least that's what's going on in their mind. So what are God's motives? God's not trying to smother us. God's not trying to take away our fun. God's not trying. Why would God give us rules and precepts all throughout the scriptures? And the first thing that I want you to see is, is his motives is that God cares about you. God cares about you deeply. And so his care, he is protecting us. He's protecting us. I want us to, can we put this up on the screen? I think it's a picture of a fence. We can go up there and, and put a, a picture of a fence. You know, uh, there was a, a, couple of, a couple of years ago that we actually redid the fence all around the back of Memorial. And, and one of those houses that actually butts up to that fence happens to be my house. And so I remember that the fence was taken down and anyone, and anyone just could have 
walked in my backyard. And let me tell you, for about a month that it was down, they were, you know, reconstructing all that kind of stuff. It was weird. It was really weird. I didn't even want to go outside in my, my backyard because, I, you know, you know, anybody could see me. And, and you know, I, I want you to get this. God gives you his rules throughout the scriptures as a protecting fence for your life. My, my girls, they can go outside and play in my backyard now that the fence is up. It's been up for years, but they can go out and play outside. And, and I don't have to worry about them. Because I know that they are within the protective fence that we have. When you stay within the, the, the bounds that God gives us and through His rules, you're protected. You go outside of those rules, you go outside the fence, and you've got to deal with the consequences. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not grace if you mess up, but you have to deal with the consequences of going outside of His protection. So the first thing that we write down is that his, his first motive is that he cares about you. The second motive that I want you to write down is his holiness. His holiness. Now, holiness simply means that it's a lot of times people will say the word holier, holier than thou. Or, and they think, you know, holiness means perfection. And it can. But holiness, the word holy, just simply means to be separate. When God called the people in the Old Testament, he said, be holy. He was telling them, be separate. Don't look like the other nations. Don't do what they do. Don't worship the gods that, that they worship. That's why he said, don't intermarry with them. Because when you intermarry with them, then you're going to take on their beliefs. And he says, I want you to be separate. I want you to think back about that fence. What does that fence do? It not only protects, but it also separates. It separates you from other people's yards. It separates you from other boundaries that might be out there. I've had fences that uh, in, in years past, I used to live um, next to some woods. And so it separated our property line from someone else's property line or separated us from the, the woods that were behind us. And so holiness, what it does is it separates us. Not to be holier than thou or anything like that, but it does show that there is a difference and that's what God calls us to do with his rules. He wants us to be, look, smell, and act different than the world. And then there's one more thing that I want you to, to see is that uh, his rules show his desires. They show his desires. You know, in my own yard, I'm able to do what I want. If I want to plant a tree, I can plant a tree. If I want to, if I want to just grow grass, I can grow grass. If I want to put down a sidewalk, I can put down a sidewalk. There's, there's certain things that, that within the confines of my fence that we can have our, our own desires. And so I want you to hear this loud and clear. A lot of times God's rules, you go, God, why did you do that? And it's just the way he desires things. Go back to Cain and Abel. He accepted Cain's sacrifice. He didn't accept Abel's sacrifice. He, God just has desires. I want this, not that. And so when, when we stay within, and so sometimes God just gives us rules because he says, this is what I desire. This is what I want. And so I want us to have in our mind that God gives rules to his people, but his motives are pure. If you're a teacher in the house today, I know we have a lot of teachers in here. Maybe you work over here at Memorial or maybe you're out uh, in Jefferson Parish. But we have a lot of teachers in the house. This just makes sense. This just makes sense. You probably have your classroom rules. And again, they're there for your care. They're there for the protection of the kids. Think about that. You don't want to run around getting hurt. Holiness. Your class is separate. It is not a playground. It is a classroom. There's a difference there. There's a holiness there, a separation there. Your desires, your desires. You're there to teach, instruct, and nurture. That's the desire. You're to help little ones or maybe even teenagers to, to have purpose in their life. So that's what you're doing. You have your desires. So, I mean, this is clear. But what happens when we mess up? When we mess up, of course, I mentioned this earlier, what happens when we go outside the fence of God? Now, certainly there are consequences, but he offers us grace. And we talked about this last week, how grace, like an acrobat who's doing a, a routine, if he falls, he has a net to catch him. If we didn't have the net to catch us, called God's grace as Christians, we would fall and we wouldn't hit the ground. We would hit the law of God and we would be shattered on it. And so here God gives us grace. I'll prove it to you. 
Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, we'll put it up here on the screen, says, for we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. I'm talking about our weaknesses to give in to certain things. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Who's it talking about there? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus has, has been tempted. And so he can empathize with the way that we are tempted. Nevertheless, he did it in such a way and did not sin. But don't miss this. Verse 16 says, so let us approach God's throne of grace. When we go outside the bounds, when we mess up, when we screw up, let's go through the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help us in our time of need, okay? So this is a proper view of what it means to be a disciple and a proper view really of, of God's rules. Now here I wanna show you what legalism does. Remember, legalism looks good, it looks bright, it glows but it actually brings about destruction. It's deadly. It creeps in and looks like light. It looks good, but it's not light and it's harmful. And so here's what, here's what it does. Notice God gets replaced with people. God gets replaced with people. And so the Pharisees, notice in this passage, the Pharisees, they take the rules of God. God wants his people to be ceremonially clean. He does. But they take a tradition and they add it on. Essentially, they take the rules of God and they add a rule on top of it. They're, they're adding rules to God's rules. Now, there's nothing wrong with having things that help you in your walk with God, okay? Okay. I have a friend of mine who listens to worship music and he, he, we were actually talking about this this week. We we're having a great conversation. We were talking about, we hold each other accountable with our Bible reading, especially as we're going through Leviticus right now, you know? So we're holding each other accountable with our Bible reading. And so he'll text me throughout the day, said, have you done yours? And, and I'll text him, have you done yours? That type of thing. And we were just having a good conversation this week. And he says, listen, he said, I try to only listen to, to worship music until I read my Bible. He said, if I haven't been able to have time in the morning to read my Bible, maybe I'll do it at lunch or maybe I'll even do it at night. And he said, if I listen to Christian music, it just puts me in the right frame of mind. I said, that's awesome, man. That's great. But what if he looked at me and said, you need to do this too. No, no, no. Let me take it back. You have to do this too. Do you see it? He would take his rule and put it on top of me. Does that make sense? People take their rules and they put it on top. And if he said that I had to do that, that I have to do that, that is legalism. And that there's no longer a fence of protection. It's a cage of oppression. Legalism is no longer God's fence saying, I'm trying to protect you in my love and in my care. It's when someone else puts a rule around you and it holds you in a cage of oppression. And so it's people giving rules to other people. Let's put that up there. People giving rules. And so those people who are giving those rules and dealing out those rules and saying that you have to do it, this is why Jesus got in such confrontation with the Pharisees because they were putting themselves in the place of God himself. And so what are the motives? We've seen the motives of God, care, holiness, his desires. What are the motives of those people when they do that? Now remember, it looks like morality. It looks like godliness, but let's just get to the heart of it. What's the real motives? Number one, control. Control. Remember, legalism creeps into a person's life. It looks good, ceremonially clean. Who don't want to be ceremonially clean? If you're Jewish, I want to be ceremoniously clean if I were Jewish. But it's all about control. Let me give you almost like a drastic example, but I think it will click. I had a friend years ago, this is before Carrie Ann and I were even married. 
And we, were, we had a Bible study in her apartment. Man, it's just a great group. We got together and we'd study the Word of God. And we would kind of go around uh, and, and different ones would lead on different weeks. Sometimes we do that in our uh, adult Bible study back here. And so different ones of us would lead different weeks. And so we had one of our guys that got in there. And man, he, he, he really had something on his heart that night. I mean, you could really tell that he was all there. And, and so we sit down, we're getting ready to to have our Bible study, and, and uh, he says, man, guys, I got something. I mean, it's really weighing on my heart. And so we're like, yes, what, what's going on? And, and, and he says, I really think that we should only use the King James Version of the Bible. And I was like, holy smokes. We're about to go there. Now, listen to me. I'm all about biblical accuracy. I mean, you guys know me. Y'all know my heart. I mean, I, I, every sermon, I'm looking up different words in Greek and Hebrew. I want to know exactly what they, they say. But to say that the 1611 King James is the only version, I mean, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, right? You know? But to say that it's the only version, listen, I've read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, and not one sermon goes by that I don't look up things in the original language. But, but this is legalism. And what was happening was he had a pastor who was dumping this into him, and then he was passing it on to us. It was entirely about control. And if you go back and you go back to that pastor and you go, the the whole situation was just so messed up. And it it wasn't about necessarily about biblical accuracy. It had everything to do with control. And so what does legalism look like in our culture? It can look like how to dress, if you don't dress this way, if you don't act this way, if you drink this drink, if you, it's rules on top of rules and it has to do with control. Second thing, the second motive is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Now this is so important because for a long time I thought, you know, people who are legalistic, they worship rules. They don't worship God, they worship rules. But then the more I study, the more I I search the scriptures, I realize that it's not that they worship rules, they actually worship themselves. They worship themselves. Why did Jesus get into such hot pursuit with the Pharisees and the scribes? It wasn't because they worshiped the rules, it was because they were self-righteous. Again, they take God out, and they put themselves in at the top. And so legalism doesn't worship God, it worships self. And any worship of self, listen to me, leads to narcissism, arrogance, and perfectionism. Narcissism, arrogance, and perfectionism. Legalism doesn't point to the glory of God. Legalism points to the glory of self. Look at me. Look what I'm, look how I am following these rules. And as many of you know, Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so I don't think that there's any person in here that would necessarily have a, a checklist. I don't know any person that would say, okay, I've got this checklist. And as long as, you know, I'm going to check all these, these things off. And if I do these things, then, then I am righteous. But let me tell you something. They live that way. And this is where people begin to feel the harmful effects of legalism themselves. Because it's, it looks like morality, right? It glows. It looks like morality. It looks like godliness. And, and this is where people, they, and, and, where they can't put a finger it on it themselves. And then people that are on the outside looking at that person, they go, something's just not right. I, I can't, I can't put my, my finger on it. And this is where I feel like in the world today, you know how some people have said, you know, Christians, all they do is judge. All they do is judge. I hear what they're saying, and I know the scriptures that go along with this. I know that as Christians that we're called to judge within the church if someone is caught up in a sin for accountability reasons. From the outside that we, we're not called to judge because it's the world acting like the world, and we're longing for that person to give their soul to Jesus. 
But from the world's perspective and from other Christians' perspective, they say, you're, you're just judging me. But here's the fact of the matter is, I think that's what they're thinking because they don't know the term self-righteousness. And what they're doing is their, their bells and whistles are picking up on that self-righteousness and it comes off not as judgment, but as condemnation. Why are you condemning me? Do you, as we say in Mississippi, do you smell what I'm stepping in? And so this self-righteousness seeps its way in. And so here's what I find. The people that, that, that have let legalism seep into their lives, there is an us versus them mentality. Not a heart to see people saved. Or if they're a Christian, not a heart to see them come back to Christ. There is a culture of guilt rather than a culture of joy. Here's how you know that if a little bit of that radium has seeped into your life. You know, I really need to read more. I really need to pray more. There's a, there's a sense of, uh, of guilt rather than, man, I just want to spend time with my God. You know what? Maybe you haven't read. You know what? I, I miss Jesus. I want to spend more time with Jesus. I want to get in prayer and I want to spend more time in G with Jesus. Do you see the difference? Condemnation versus craving. Does that make sense? And so you have that sense of how legalism, it looks good and then it seeps in and it brings about a spiritual fatigue. And then there's one thing that I want to mention and you guys know this. Y'all know how it's so important to be driven by the truth. But self-righteousness, self-righteous people are more interested in being right than they are being kind. Now, don't get this confused with taking a stand for Jesus, okay? There's a difference in taking a stand for Jesus and being legalistic. Legalism condemns and legalism criticizes. And you say, well, Pastor Dan, okay, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, can, I just, can I just show you a great example? About, do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? In fact, you know what? I tell you what, we got a little bit of time. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Let's just go there. You got to see this. Luke chapter 15. You know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, he, he wants his inheritance. He leaves his father. He squanders his money. And then when the money runs out, and so does the fun, he's feeding his pigs and he starts longing for their slop. And he says to himself, you know what? I'll go back to dad. And dad embraces him and he throws a celebration because he's turned his, his life around. But don't miss this. Look with me in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 28. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 28. There's this other brother. Don't miss the brother that came back. There's this other brother who did everything right, but he was driven by legalism. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. Do you see it? It's not a fence of protection. It is a cage. I have been slaving for you. And this seeps into good Christian people all across the United States where they're following the rules of God and it's slavery to them. But when this son of yours, verse 30, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He's angry about repentance. He's angry about all this because he's done it all right. And this is self-righteousness to a T. My son, the father said, verse 31, you're always with me and everything I have is yours, but we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. See, here's the deal. It's not so much about the rules. The rules are important. They're a, a way of protecting you. It's about the relationship that you have. The, old, the, the other son who had done everything right had focused his whole life on the rules, but not having a relationship with the father. 
It's a great example of legalism. It's self-righteousness. I've done it all rather than having a relationship with the Father who is the one who has done it all. Philippians 3 verse 8. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to put it up here on the screen. What is more? I consider everything loss of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Did you catch that? The apostle Paul comes on the scene and says, everything that I've done, everything good that I've done, everything can fall apart because the only thing that I wanna live for is for knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Notice what it says. It doesn't say I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of obeying Christ Jesus my Lord. Now that's important, but that's not the core. The core is knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider all the good stuff that I've done, everything that I've done for you, I consider that stuff garbage, that I may gain Christ. Look at this, verse nine, and be found in him. Now, don't miss it. He's talking about exactly what we're talking about today. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that comes from the rules, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about having a relationship with him. And so there's a final thing, a final motive that people have when they put themselves in the place of God and they start putting all these rules on other people. And number three is simply this, appearance. Appearance. It's how it looks. It doesn't actually have a heart for God. It picks and chooses what it's want. It's like a buffet. It's like, it's like, it's like buffet spirituality. It's like Piccadilly spirituality. If you were to go to Piccadilly and say, okay, I want this, but I don't want that. Okay, let me give you some examples. Okay, no drinking. Not even a glass of wine at dinner. Oh, so I'm not gonna have that. That's part, that's, eh, I don't like that part of the buffet. But you know what? You know what? I will take some good old gossip. Oh yeah, give me that one. Let me gossip. I'll take that one. In the old days, and they made fun of this with the, the movie Footloose. In the old days, it was dancing. Okay, hold the dancing, hold the dancing, but I'll take some consumerism. I'll take some consumer, you know, so you know, I, want, I want stuff. I'll take some of that, a little greed and coveting. Oh, that won't hurt. And Jesus comes on the scene. If you go back, I know we've got our children that are studying the Sermon on the Mount, and I know that we've got our adult Sunday school class that's studying the, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and so Jesus comes on the scene and, and he says, look, it's not just about the appearance you cannot commit adultery with someone, so you don't have that appearance. You don't have that law that you've broken. Oh, but man, you've lusted in your heart. So you don't have external unrighteousness. Oh, but you've got internal unrighteousness. It's not just about committing murder. It's about hating. And then he goes on to say, hey, don't, don't, don't pray where people will see you. That's legalism. They wanted to be seen, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they wanted to praise and they would do it in such a way that people would see them. It's about appearance. He says, don't fast so that people see you. He says, don't give your offering and make a big deal about that. It says, it's where we get that word hypocrite. Jesus uses the word hypocrite right here in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse seven, he says, hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, you honor me with your lips, your lips. It's all about appearance, but your heart, what's on the inside, it's so far from God. And this is where we get the word hypocrite. The word hypocrite ultimately came into the English from the Greek word hypocrites, which means actor or a stage player. In the first century, when Jesus was alive, they would take these masks. You can Google this. Look up the word hypocrite. It's almost like a ceramic mask. And they would put on this mask and they would play someone that they weren't. That's what a hypocrite is. And that's what legalism does. Legalism puts on this, this face. Look at all the things I've done. Look at the, look at the rules that I abide by. And there's no love for their neighbor. Look what I'm doing, and they're just an actor because once you take the mask off and you actually get to the root of that person, there's nothing but bitterness, there's no joy, and there's hate. And the person that they probably hate the most is themselves. Legalism is all about performance, and that's why it's so deadly. I've met some of the most moral people. Let me tell you, I have met some of the most moral people 
And they are some of the most miserable people. Because they have rules, but they don't have Christ. If you didn't understand any of that, let me give you a great example because Valentine's Day is coming up. And I've used this example many times if you've been here with me at Memorial, so just hang with me. This past, we got Valentine's Day coming up and then last month was uh, my 14th anniversary. It was so cool. Had the opportunity and, and here's what I did. You wanna hear what I did? So I got a dozen roses, flame tip. You know, let's, let's put them up on the screen. Yeah, the flame tip rose. These are good kind. Men, Valentine's Day is coming up. You can go red or you can go flame tip. I'm just giving you a tip, okay? You can go flame tip. So I got her, I got her a uh, dozen flame tip. And I came up here. And uh, so I got them the day before. And uh, I didn't want her to see them. So I, I came up here and I, I hit them up in my office. Okay. So I hit them up in my office. And then that morning I went running and then came, came back, came back to my office, got them. And I put them like right on the, the kitchen counter so that when uh, Carrie Ann got up, she would walk in and she would just be amazed, you know, and, and go, oh, that's so sweet. So that next morning I'm waiting at the kitchen table and the kids are around. We're all excited. And Carrie Ann walks in and walks right past him. So we're all just kind of sitting there. <laughs> How you doing? And finally, she walks in. I think she walked out to get a cup of coffee or something. I forget what she did. Anyway, so she goes out to get a cup, a cup of coffee or something like that. And then she sees them. She goes, oh, you shouldn't have. What if I responded to my wife and say, well, today is our anniversary. I'm supposed to. It's my duty probably be sleeping in the doghouse that night. That's what legalism is. I'm doing for God. Performance-based, right? It's all about me. It's really not about her. It's my duty. But what if on the opposite side of the spectrum, she sees them. She goes, you shouldn't have. And I look right back at her and I said, I did it because I love you. I did it because you're my soulmate. And I did it because I'm so thankful for the relationship that we have been able to celebrate for the past 14 years. Do you see the difference? I did it. Some of y'all are so, you love, the, it's, uh, obedience is good. Hear my heart. I'm not saying disobedience is good. Obedience is good. Following and doing what's right is good. But it all goes back to why you do it. Is it because you worship yourself and you follow the rules because of that? Or is it because you love Jesus? Because it's all about Jesus. 